For 17 years, I served as Assistant Deputy General at the Department of Justice. I worked essentially as the Chief Operating Officer. In those years, I developed a very close relationship with the Deputy Attorney General, who in many private discussions disclosed highly top secret information that really shook me to the core. This intel related to the existence of a secret society you may know as the Illuminati, an organization comprised of the wealthiest 1% on the planet. And for over 300 years, they have been secretly controlling all aspects of human activity for the sole purpose of serving their own hidden agenda to one day rule the planet as a single world government. The second alarming revelation by this Deputy Attorney General was the coexistence of an extraterrestrial race that has been on Earth practically since the beginning, monitoring the human condition and orchestrating their own dark and sinister agenda. Now, the really interesting aspect of all of this is that this alien race formed a unified pact with the Illuminati around the 1940s, the purpose of which was to maneuver mankind's path through a deplorable stage of servitude. What the 1% got out of that deal is absolute immunity. They're able to live out their lives as they please while the rest of humanity uh, faces a global act of genocide with the few remaining survivors relegated to slavery. Now when you bring up the 9-11 event, the truth of the matter is that it was an inside job, but designed and orchestrated not by corrupt factions within the government, as the conspiracy theorists would have you believe, but by this unholy union between the alien race and the Illuminati. They control the planet. 9-11 was just one phase of their objective to bring humanity to its knees. And it saddens me to say that humanity is on the brink of its darkest stage. For years, there have been rumors that there's a UFO cover-up, but that some of those involved want to end it. There are stories about factions within the intelligence community at war with each other over the UFO issue. Some want disclosure, others don't. The problem isn't the existence of aliens. The problem is the inescapable implication that the government has known about this for decades, but lied about it. It would be a constitutional and legal nightmare and would fundamentally undermine the credibility of political leaders. On June 24th, 1947, a pilot, Kenneth Arnold, saw nine strange craft flying in formation over the Cascade Mountains in Washington State, traveling at a speed of well over a thousand miles an hour. The media got wind of the story and labeled these mystery objects flying saucers or flying disks. Further reports came in from other locations in the United States and from countries all around the world. What were these strange craft? What were they doing? And who was flying them? Then, as flying saucer fever swept across the nation, in early July 1947, something crashed in the New Mexico desert, close to an army airfield. The name of this base was Roswell. Wreckage from the crash was gathered up from a local ranch by military intelligence officers stationed at Roswell. Then, in an extraordinary turn of events, the US military reached out to the media and let it be known that they'd recovered one of these strange craft. A news release read as follows. The many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday when the intelligence officer of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force Roswell Army Airfield was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc. At the time, the 509th Bomb Group was the only atomic bomb capable squadron anywhere in the world. Roswell was arguably the most strategically important military base on the face of the planet. Unbelievably, within 24 hours, the military issued a follow-up report claiming that the object had simply been a weather balloon. Could the military intelligence personnel at this elite military unit really have misidentified debris from a weather balloon? In 2007, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid quietly got together with two like-minded colleagues, both now deceased, Senator Ted Stevens and Senator Daniel Inouye. 
they instigated a program known as the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP. To add to the confusion about this project, it's also been described as the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program and the Advanced Aerial Threat Identification Program. Irrespective of the title, the brief was clear. Investigate and evaluate all aerial objects and phenomena that might pose a threat to the air defense of the United States. In some cases, such objects might be secret prototype aircraft, missiles, or drones. In other cases, they were UFOs. The story that exploded into the public domain in the pages of the New York Times occurred in 2004 off the coast of San Diego and involved two Navy aircrew, Commander David Fravor and Lieutenant Commander Jim Slate. Each man was flying a Navy F-18 Super Hornet and in the middle of a routine training flight, the pilots were vectored towards an uncorrelated target that radar operators on board the USS Princeton were tracking. It was the latest in a series of strange radar returns that the Navy cruiser had detected over a two-week period, and this time, commanders were determined to get to the bottom of the mystery. Fravor headed towards the mystery object and spotted it just above the ocean. The sea was white, as if it was boiling. Suddenly, the object accelerated towards him before veering away. Unable to see it, the aircraft were vectored to a rendezvous point some 60 miles away, only to be told by an astonished radar operator that the mystery object had appeared at the precise location they were heading for, while the two Navy jets were still 40 miles away. I have no idea what I saw, Fravor said, but I want to fly one. My gosh, there's a whole fleet of them. Look at that thing. Another unidentified pilot loudly exclaims in a second video. The footage was taken by an advanced targeting forward-looking infrared pod. And in a humorous twist, the makers, Raytheon, rushed out a press release boasting about how their technology was used in US government UFO hunting. There has been a concerted effort by hundreds of government officials and military officers to expose the truth of this extraterrestrial race coexistence. Many have issued sworn testimonies before Congress and even provided tangible evidence, including videos of mysterious aircrafts performing aerial navigations that no man-made craft can achieve, uh, radar samples, metals and alloys not from this Earth, as well as credible witness testimonies. But the response from the government was to sweep it under the carpet, as they were instructed to do so, as well as the media. That's why the public remains ill-informed about what's really happening. And this also paves the way for the unholy unification to carry out the next phase of their game plan. Faking an alien threat is what the man who developed the space rocket, Werner von Braun, allegedly described on his deathbed as being the last card. The ultimate way in which shadowy forces would make their bid to take over the world. Because if 9-11 brought us the Patriot Act, which many believe was a tool to take away various rights and freedoms, then a faked alien invasion could allow the Illuminati, or whoever these unseen forces of darkness may be, to sweep away not just freedoms, but the entire concept of nationhood. The world would have to unite to fight the common alien foe. It would, literally, bring about a new world order. It sounds like science fiction, but if it isn't, the revelations about ATIP may be a sign that the diabolical plan is about to be put into motion. The history of the Illuminati and its formation is absolutely fascinating. And I would urge all people to educate themselves about them, do the research, Learn all that you can about this very nefarious entity that governs our planet. Because they are the true enemy of the people. They are our puppet masters, and we are completely oblivious to that fact. The one thing they do fear is exposure. And if we can do that, then we can save ourselves from virtual extinction. Across the world, 
Freemasons were already dividing into factions, and the same is true of those in America. In 1733, the provincial Grand Master of all North America, Henry Price, granted a charter to a group of Freemasons in Boston. A most auspicious day for the Freemasons, as it was for the Knights Templar and the Knights of Malta. The 24th of June, St John's Day, and this new lodge was to be known as St John's Lodge. St John was seen as equal importance by many to Jesus. A Freemason by the name of Adam Weishaupt created a new Masonic order in Bavaria called the Illuminati, which was to catch the eye of many and still does. There is no real hard evidence that the Illuminati still exist, but their influence on the world stage was vast. Jefferson spoke highly of Weissab, and Washington wrote in a letter about the Illuminati. It was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati had not spread to the United States. On the contrary, no one is more truly satisfied of this fact than I am. This is clear evidence that this highly secret group had in fact spread into the USA. And for what purpose? We only have to look at the words of Weishaupt himself when he said, the Illuminati will, by degrees and in silence, possess themselves of the government of the states and make use of those means. A famous statement by the Illuminati reveals why history can often be confusing, why sometimes it appears there are two sides when in truth there is only one end result already planned. The statement goes thus, it doesn't matter who the people voted for, they always vote for us. An interesting statement from a Jesuit created a Freemasonic group. Patience is a virtue, and by 1850, Freemasonry was on the increase again. It grew from 66,000 members to over 200,000, with 5,000 lodges nationwide. By the time of the American Civil War, it was so widespread that both sides in the conflict were often seen to join in lodges together. The following statement is from a book entitled a History of the York and Scottish Rites of Freemasonry by Henry R. Evans. Into Freemasonry have been poured the irradations of the mystical schools of antiquity. Particularly is this so in the high degrees of the order, such as the Scottish Rite, where undeniable traces of Kabbalism, Neoplatonism, Rosicrucianism and other mystical cults are plainly discernible. I do not personally contend that Freemasonry is the direct descendant of the mysteries, but that our ritual makers of the higher degrees have copied the ancient ceremonies of initiation so far as the knowledge of those ceremonies exists. As we can see, the forging of America was by the Freemasons. Some stand out more than others. It's time to take a look at them in more detail in order to unlock further secrets. One of the most influential men in the American Revolution was Benjamin Franklin, a writer, scientist, philosopher, and of course, Freemason. And what of the Constitution? 28 of the 40 who signed the document were known or possible Freemasons. In London, he worked with Sir Francis Dashwood, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who founded a secret order known as the Hellfire Club. These links across a secretive world allowed Franklin to manipulate the powers, to spread word widely and secretly to enact plans created in private between some of the most powerful men in the world.
revolution does not just happen. It is in fact planned and masses cajoled into behaving as desired. Thomas Jefferson, a Freemason, actually explained in his preface to the Declaration of Independence what Franklin's and the Freemasons were actually doing. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitles them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. The great seal of the United States, as seen on the dollar bill itself, is a Freemasonic symbol that openly states their purpose. The unfinished pyramid is the Masonic trestle board, explaining the task ahead of completion is a Freemasonic role. The 13 steps to the pyramid are of mystical importance. There are 13 stars, and the Latin phrase has 13 letters. The eagle clutches 13 olive leaves and berries and 13 arrows. What is the significance? It derives from Genesis and is a nod to the 13th tribe of Israel, that of Manasseh, whose symbols were an olive branch and a bundle of arrows. Peace and war in balance. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel which have been always waste but it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely all of them they shall dwell safely there in the land of the free the eagle itself is evidence for this for it is biblically the destroyer of serpents all-seeing eye is that of the Freemasons and their grand architect, all-seeing all over the world. The seal of the United States is boldly full of Freemasonic symbolism, stating the New World Order in Latin for all to see. They make no apology for it, and why should they? As in the later Spanish Revolt, itself blatantly orchestrated by Freemasons and aided by American money, they were proud to have bought the land back from the sword, so they shall dwell safely once more. The Spanish flag itself would also become a Freemasonic symbol. So what does all of this mean to the secret world of America? As it stands today, there are over 15,000 lodges in the USA. That's almost half the total lodges in the entire world. There are 3 million members. That's more than half the total of those in the world. The majority of those members are active community leaders, whether business, banking, law, religion, media or politics. They are still there at the heart of Washington. They still sit on the boards of big corporations. still control the finances. This land that steers the hearts and minds of billions through movies, media, politics and money was influenced from the very beginning by a sincere group of men fleeing tyranny and hoping for a new world. Over time they have influenced the world and played many games of revolution to assist brothers in far off lands achieve the same. If we are 
are still in doubt about the influence the Freemasons and the inner sanctum of the Illuminati play, then let us remember the words of one 18th century Freemason who was so shocked by the global conspiracy that he put it down in black and white. John Robinson, a professor of philosophy at Edinburgh University, so disliked the purposes of the Illuminati that he said, An association has been formed for the express purpose of rooting out all the religious establishments and overturning all the existing governments. The leaders would rule the world with uncontrollable power, while all the rest would be employed as tools of the ambition of their unknown superiors. But ultimately, it is not democracy to have a secret organisation at the heart of government, religion and a powerful business world. One of the most disturbing aspects of the pact formed by the alien race and the Illuminati were the terms of their agreement. In exchange for immunity and shared technologies, the aliens would have clearance to abduct thousands of men, women, and children every year for their own scientific research. While many of these abductees were safely returned to their lives with little memories of the incidents, the majority of the rest were extinguished and disposed of. Now, the government did know about this. They even formed a treaty in 1954, signed by none other than President Eisenhower. It was known as the Greata Treaty, which gave the alien race the freedom to abduct people in perpetuity, meaning it continues to this day. Over the years, hundreds of thousands of UFO sightings have been logged and investigated, some by government programs, others by civilian research groups such as MUFON. While many of these sightings involved UFOs seen at distance, others have been decidedly up close and personal. There are some cases where it's claimed witnesses got so close to a UFO that there were physical effects, and sometimes even injury and illness, burn marks, suspected radiation sickness. Simply being taken against your will is frightening enough. But what if our own government is aware of abductions and are powerless to prevent it? Or even more frightening is the theory that they are in league with the aliens and have signed treaties to allow humans to be taken and used as the aliens see fit. If the government is aware of the abduction phenomenon, would it matter to an abductee? A troubling and persistent phenomenon has been occurring throughout history to people on Earth for centuries. The belief that they are being taken by beings from some other place, perhaps outer space or another dimension. These people have real memories of being taken secretly against their will by apparently non-human entities and subjected to complex physical and psychological procedures. There are famous modern cases, such as the Betty and Barney Hill abduction, the Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker abduction, and the Travis Walton abduction. However, for every well-documented abduction case on record, there are hundreds of less known cases where people have experienced alien abductions. Abductee has been used a lot over the years uh, to explain how um, some unknown intelligence, it might be extraterrestrial, it might even be from another dimension or another time, have, that these entities have come to take people against their will, to do things, they, they take them away, they do things to these people that are very unpleasant, and the whole thing leaves the person that went through this type of ex experience <laughs> um, very victimized. But um, the term experiencer is a bit more loose. It is just indicating that somebody's encountered um, an intelligence but not necessarily been traumatized by it in all cases, not necessarily been taken 
um, in all cases, just they've come into contact with it. Um, the term contactee actually was another term that was used um, back you know, in the 50s, a little bit in the 60s, that kind of a thing. It's no longer in vogue, but experiencer is, I think, the, the proper term for it because not everybody's taken and those who go are not always taken against their will. The late Professor John Edward Mack, a respected Harvard University psychiatrist, was asked to investigate an experiencer's case and became so perplexed by the phenomenon that he devoted a substantial amount of time to investigating additional cases. His desire was to understand objectively what was going on. Professor Mack eventually concluded that the only phenomenon in psychiatry that adequately explained the patient's symptoms in several of the most compelling cases was post-traumatic stress disorder. This would imply that the patient genuinely believed that the remembered frightening incident had really occurred. These people have been examined by myself, they've been tested psychologically, they are of a, above average intelligence, they are of sound mind, they've been shown as of su superior mental functioning by the testers, so they, there is not indication of any kind of psychiatric condition that can account for this that I've been able to find. In fact, when one abductee hears the story of another abductee, they react with shock because they don't want to believe it's true they would rather believe it's a dream or a form of mental illness than that this is something real because it's so shattering to their notion of reality. And that's, that's happened over and over again among the people I've been working with. The Hindu Mahabharata describes weapons reminiscent of guided rockets, beam weapons, and nuclear devices being used in an ancient war between alien races. Technologies that, from their description, could only be advanced propulsion systems as well. During medieval times, tales of the succubus and other fairy creatures are reminiscent of extraterrestrial visitations. In fact, throughout history, references to aliens, gods, or other beings having come from the stars are quite common. Many researchers today are beginning to piece together a theory that we ourselves may be the product of alien intervention. Humans could be a hybrid created by the extraterrestrials and left here on Earth to be monitored in some long-term experiment. but there are species that... <clears throat> I believe that the government knows so much more about this phenomena than they're letting on that even finding out the tip of the iceberg of what they know is gonna put people in shock. Um, but as I'm in actively involved in the local MUFON chapter in Michigan, we get uh, currently about 200 sightings a year just in Michigan. And that is enough to fill your plate several times over with UFO cases. So to me, it's almost at a point where I don't care what the government knows and what they're hiding. I've got an embarrassment of riches here with the number of UFO cases coming into our local chapter. You know, I, I don't need them to, to try to hide anything because it's all 
you know, just flowing freely now. People are talking about what's happening to them openly. While alien abductions did not achieve widespread attention until the 1960s, there were many similar stories circulating decades earlier. These early abduction-like accounts have been dubbed paleo abductions by UFO researcher Jerome Clark. In an 1897 edition of the Stockton, California Daily Mail, Colonel H.G. Shaw claimed he and a friend were harassed by three tall, slender humanoids whose bodies were covered with a fine, downy hair. Colonel Shaw reported that these beings tried to kidnap the pair. The 1955 publication of Harold T. Wilkins' Flying Saucers Uncensored declared that Carl Hunrath and Wilbur Wilkinson, who had claimed they were contacted by aliens, had disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Wilkins reported his speculation that the duo was the victims of alleged abduction by flying saucers. A wave of contactee cases emerged in the 1950s as well. These individuals claimed to have been contacted by aliens. However, the substance of contactee narratives is often regarded as quite different from alien abduction accounts. Widespread publicity was generated by the Betty and Barney Hill abduction case of 1961. The Hill incident was probably the prototypical abduction case and was perhaps the first in which the claimant described beings that later became widely known as the Greys and in which the beings were said to explicitly identify as extraterrestrial origin. Proving alien abductions is difficult without obvious physical evidence. When an experiencer is returned, all he has to prove his encounter are the fragments of memories left intact by the aliens. Though throughout the history of UFO studies, countless cases have occurred that do indeed present physical evidence, many are not aware of this or the facts of a case are simply ignored. Details in each case often are the proof an encounter happened, but even with specific details, we're left with the account and the sincerity of the witness. California podiatrist Dr. Roger Lear claims to have removed alien implants from patients. Alien implants is a term used in ufology to describe a physical object placed in someone's body after they have been abducted by aliens. Claimed abilities of the implants range from telepresence, mind control, and biotelemetry, the way we tag wild animals for study. As with UFO subjects in general, the idea of alien implants has seen very little attention from mainstream scientists. We found in several cases that they put out an electromagnetic field measurable on a gauss meter of about six milligauss. And if anybody's in the electronics or radio, you'll know that's a pretty, pretty strong uh, magnetic field. Uh, when they're taken out of the body, they don't do anything. Also on an instrument called a trimeter, we get a mid-range reading on a combined scale, electrical scale, and magnetic scale, and uh, that's also a pretty strong reading. We have uh, an electrical engineer that we've used, and he has uh, designed a special probe that's connected with an oscilloscope so we can read the wave and see what it looks like, and he says there's a good indication uh, that there's something going in and there's something coming out. So uh, obviously these uh, objects are in communication with uh, somebody at some distance. Since the 1940s, there have been countless sightings and even physical encounters with the uh, extraterrestrials by ordinary citizens. Thousands of videos and photos have been taken, the best of which have been confiscated by the government and never released to the public. See, the last thing the government wants is public disclosure about the alien presence because they fear the sociological repercussions that would follow. 
if the people knew that in an advanced race uh, superseded our government, it would lead to social upheaval. I mean, why answer to a government that really wasn't in charge? The consequences of the truth could lead to social disorder. That's why there's been a decades-long effort to suppress the truth. Sightings have been caught on camera in Chile, Bolivia, and Brazil, and it's fair to say a lot of people are losing their minds over them. The latest of these sightings was filmed in the Chilean capital of Santiago, with four glowing orbs seen hovering above skyscrapers in the city. It has been viewed over 100,000 times and has split the online community on whether it's actually genuine. Commentators on YouTube were quick to give their opinion, with many believing that an alien invasion is in the cards, while others simply thought it was either military planes or helicopters. Neither seems entirely convincing. This came after more eerie footage emerged earlier in the month in a rural neighborhood in Bolivia where a giant flying saucer was captured on film above mountains in El Alto, a city in the northwest Bolivian region of La Paz. The clip shows an unusually shaped object flying through the sky before disappearing and then reappearing in the clouds. It was uploaded to a UFO spotting website dedicated to gathering evidence of alien sightings and has now been shared worldwide. Cynics believe that the footage is a hoax to increase online traffic for the filmmaker's website and has simply been created by using a digital editing program. Believers were given yet another chance of hope in southern Brazil too with a very similar looking UFO appearing in their skies. The Express reported that a woman named Marmel posted the picture online showing another blurred disc shape in the sky which she didn't even notice while taking the scenic photo. Could this be evidence that the Kachinas are returning? South America has some of the most amazing UFO encounters on record. Especially remarkable is the sheer variety of the sightings which range from straightforward accounts of flying objects to abductions, landings, cattle mutilation, as well as contactee accounts and strange beings that emerge from oddly shaped craft. In addition, there are particularities to these sightings that are uniquely South American twists to the tales that are to be found on no other continent. Undoubtedly, the best known of the South American encounters occurred in 1957. A Brazilian farmer by the name of Vilas Boas was working in his fields with a tractor when he claims he was abducted by aliens and taken aboard a spacecraft. There, he claims to have had intercourse with a beautiful fair-skinned girl with high cheekbones, a very pointed chin, and vivid blue Chinese-type slant eyes, who stood about 4 feet 8 inches high without her helmet. The case was thoroughly investigated, and researchers admitted feeling impressed at the clarity of Boa's evidence. In the ensuing months and years, the details were checked and rechecked by dozens of separate people without revealing any contradiction in the nature of the farmer's story. As such, it merits its notoriety as one of the most riveting abduction accounts on record. In August 1962, for example, there was an incident that made even the Boas case look tame. Unfortunately, on this occasion, the victim did not survive to tell the tale. Briefly, the facts are these. On the 19th of that month, two glowing red spheres the size of footballs are reported to have flown over the hut of a poor diamond prospector named Revilino Marfa de Salva. Later, two aliens, approximately 1.5 feet in height, entered the hut and peered at the family as they lay in bed. The next day, one of the man's sons was surprised to discover two strange balls outside the hut. One was entirely black, and the other black and white. When the father came out to look at them, they apparently rose up at him and enveloped him in a cloud of yellow smoke. He was never seen again. 
Shortly afterwards, the son was reported to have been taken into custody by the Brazilian army, some say as a means of silencing him. Another astonishing encounter occurred in 1973 near the town of Catanduva, Brazil. The 70s were to prove the heyday of South American encounters, and this is perhaps one of the most sensational. A traveling salesman returning home in a torrential downpour suddenly found his car radio cut out on him, followed shortly afterwards by the engine of the car. Almost immediately, a blinding beam of blue light then shone down from above, and overwhelmed by a great sense of heat, the driver panicked and fled from the car. The salesman was later to testify that his vehicle became transparent and his skin began to burn as he lapsed into unconsciousness. Hours later, he was discovered spread-eagled in the road by people in a passing car who called the police. Taken to a hospital, he was quickly discharged, but later strange blotches developed on his abdomen. The examining doctor's opinion was that they were caused by strange rays. The amazing corollary to this story is that a year later the same man disappeared for six days before being found over 500 miles away, sitting on a hill completely soaked. He later claimed to have been abducted by aliens and medically examined aboard a UFO. Then as before, doctors were impressed by his lucidity and were happy to pronounce him fully compos mentis. In 1965, around 50 Indians of the Tabu tribe were astonished to see three tall beings emerge from two saucer-like craft that came down close to the Argentinian town of Formosia, near the border with Paraguay. The beings appeared to have luminous halos around their bodies and the Indians knelt down and worshipped them. Witnesses speak of verbal contact being established with the aliens who informed the Indians that the space people would eventually come in greater numbers. An Indian who made a close approach to the craft was warned off, and eventually the beings returned to the craft which took off in a dazzling burst of light. Police who hurried to the scene are believed to have taken numerous photographs which are reputed to show at least three landed saucers and five aliens. Beings that emerged from an egg-shaped craft assured a local hunter that before long the whole world would come to know them. The hunter named Philippe Martinez claims to have met the aliens on no fewer than three occasions. The first time in 1949, he ran toward a hovering object revolving above the trees, only to be paralyzed by a mysterious burst of energy. From a door in the object, a small being then descended down a ladder. Standing no more than a meter in height, the being was described as wearing a helmet and clothes like a diver's costume. In an interview, Martinez claims to have been taken aboard one of the alien vessels, which oddly was piloted by a crew of four beings around a meter in height and another blonde-haired being just over six feet tall. He claims to have been placed in a spacesuit, but this had an alarming effect on his heart rate and the suit was quickly removed. Conversation with the aliens was slow and difficult, but according to Martinez, the aliens' name for their craft was Seal. In 1963, in Piranha State, Brazil, a crowd of onlookers was amazed to see a bright zinc-colored object descend into flames of a major forest fire. Even more astonishing was that after a quarter of an hour, several tall beings were seen to emerge from the craft and strode around in the flames completely untouched by the furnace-like heat that surrounded them. Even more perplexing was the fact that the beings seemed intent on collecting charred rocks and other material from the fire, which they then took back to the waiting spaceship. This done, the craft then departed as silently as it came. 
Witnesses described it as a basin-shaped craft 35 meters in diameter and around 8 meters in height. On this occasion, two young hunters came across a luminous machine around 10 feet wide, hovering just 2 feet from the ground. Four or five beings were seen to emerge from the craft and then attempted to drag both youths inside. Fighting them off as best they could, one of the young men lashed out with his rifle butt, bringing it down on the head of one of the aliens. Incredibly, the weapon broke into fragments as if it had struck on a rock. Finally managing to break free of the aliens, both youths ran off to summon police who later reported signs of a struggle. As in the previous incident, both youths required hospital treatment and remained in a highly agitated state for some time afterwards. In Argentina, the year 1965 brought a series of abortive abduction attempts where aliens attempted to take people by force. The national press published numerous reports of these incidents, which bear evidence of a widespread trend of which relatively few cases were adequately investigated. Of those that were, an incident in the province of Corrientes tells of five luminous craft observed flying low overhead. One vessel proceeded to land near a farmhouse and five beings around two meters tall were then seen to emerge. On their heads were instruments giving off flashes of light. The focus of the beings' attention was immediately directed at the farmhouse. Forcing their way inside, they attempted to overpower the owner and drag him away. Fighting the aliens as best he could, the farmer eventually broke free of his attackers, who fled when other villagers rushed to his assistance. Several days later, the aliens returned and attempted to abduct another man. Once again, villagers turned out in force, firing rifles which, although not able to injure the aliens, was sufficient to drive them away again. The association of Latin America with sky visitors who arrive from the stars goes back thousands of years. To native Indian cultures, these beings brought with them the rudiments of civilization, initiating major developments in science, agriculture, astronomy, and masonry. By the shores of Lake Titicaca, the ancient ruins of Teotihuacan Bear a mysterious reflection of those ancient beliefs. Here the imposing Gate of the Sun contains enigmatic hieroglyphs that some have interpreted as advanced astronomical data. The best-selling author Eric von Doniken found the place highly indicative of alien influence. He wrote, What does legend say about the mysterious city of Teotonacno? It tells of a golden ship that came from the stars, he continues. What titanic forces were at work here, and to what end? Von Doniken concludes, what secret does this city conceal? What message from other worlds awaits its solution on the Bolivian plateau? Equally evocative of mysterious influence, are the Nazca Lines etched in the Peruvian desert close to the town of Ica. Here dead straight lines traverse the desert for dozens of miles. Other shapes include depictions of monkeys, whales, and decorative birds. At ground level, the patterns are barely perceptible and only really become apparent when viewed from the air. Since the antiquity of the lines goes back thousands of years, the question has been asked and re-asked, why would an ancient people go to such immense effort to construct a line system only visible from the air? Who was meant to see it? Inevitably, von Doniken saw the answer in terms of aliens. He interpreted the lines as markers or landing strips for alien spacecraft. While this may appear a far-fetched explanation, the Indians of that area have other ideas. Their traditions frequently make mention of strange visitors who descend from the sky aboard fiery craft, visitations which they insist 
have carried on down to present day. There has always been a connection between Native Americans and beings from other parts of the universe, referred to as star people or visitors from space. In Utah's Nine Mile Canyon lies the heaviest concentration of rock art in the world. These depict beings that appear to be not quite completely human. They can be seen next to a disc-shaped object. Other beings of a more human form are raising their hands to these beings near the object. Near Christina Lake, British Columbia, Canada, there is a picture of a white disc with black wings hovering over four human figures on their knees. There are lines coming from the top of the disc which could be rays of light. Longer, more irregular lines come down from the bottom of the object. A rock painting at Chayuse Creek, Idaho depicts what appears to be a cone-shaped rocket with smoke or flames trailing behind it. In the cone is a humanoid figure apparently holding on to the inner walls. A pictograph near Kootenay Lake in British Columbia also shows an enclosed vehicle holding a single humanoid figure. It depicts what appear to be sections of the vehicle and two objects closely resembling retractable legs for landing. Numerous depictions of egg-shaped objects with wavy lines emanating from them have been found. These could be an effort to show the object in motion or some sort of light or heat. If this were to depict the sun, lines would typically be found all around the circumference of the circle. In these cases, they came only from the bottom side. In certain Cherokee legends, it's said that their people originated in the Pleiades long, long ago. They claim to have come to this world as star seeds to bring light and knowledge. If the stories are true, then modern day Cherokee, as well as other Native Americans, and many of us with Native American blood, contain Pleiadian genes. The one government agency that contains the most extensive knowledge and evidence of the alien presence is NASA. The amount of data collected by them since the 1960s is absolutely staggering. And many people have been killed in the name of protecting the secrecy. But in the ensuing years, very credible testimonies have surfaced by NASA whistleblowers, including some of the astronauts themselves. Uh, the one revelation in particular that NASA has intensely guarded from the public are the bases on the dark side of the moon. Immense domed bases that have been there by their estimate for thousands of years. And I know they're there because I had the privilege of seeing the images with my own eyes. And it's really frightening stuff. A former NASA astronaut, Dr. Brian O'Leary, stated that there is abundant evidence that we are being contacted that civilizations have been visiting us for a very long time, that their appearance is bizarre from any type of traditional materialistic Western point of view, that these visitors use the technologies of consciousness. They use toroids. They use co-rotating magnetic disks for their propulsion systems. That seems to be a common denominator of the UFO phenomenon. Prime Ministers, Chief Cabinet Secretaries and NASA astronauts all testifying to the truth that thousands of ordinary people across the globe know as fact. Aliens exist, that they have and are visiting our planet. The head of the I Command Academy of Air Defence has gone on record. He said, yes, there were particularly mysterious occurrences during military practice. At times, targets appeared, on which fighters in the air or radars set for anti-aircraft missiles trained them, but it was difficult to determine what they were exactly. We tried to take into account the problem of UFOs. Quite a bit of interesting material has appeared, and it's perfectly obvious it needs to be studied in earnest. And 
that it's necessary to address this question on a government level. Right now, you are more and more inclined to believe that UFOs exist. Military men are not usually disposed to speculation. They report the facts, every fact. They give location, heights, speeds. They rarely express such ideas about aliens. And yet, here we have seen men of high integrity, intelligence and experience. They all believe that there is some form of alien life invading our very airspace and even the space around planet Earth. The world's largest and most powerful organisation with the biggest array of technology ever known to man is NASA. They too know the truth and they are covering it up. Recently, the number of known alien planets has increased by 60%. NASA's very own Kepler Space Telescope has discovered over 1300 new exoplanets, many of which they claim might very well contain life. Paul Hertz, director of the Astrophysics Division at NASA said, most stars in our galaxy have planetary systems and a reasonable fraction of stars in our galaxy have potentially habitable planets. Recently, thousands of people cried cover-up when NASA's International Space Station live feed was cut suddenly, just as a UFO passed in clear view. The object was a horseshoe shape, and nobody has come forward with an explanation. Later footage recorded by people not working at NASA reveals a ship leaving the Earth's atmosphere and docking with another UFO, neither of which are NASA's. Scott Carpenter was a test pilot and astronaut at NASA for many years. He said, At no time when the astronauts were in space were they alone. There was a constant surveillance by UFOs. Colonel Buzz Aldrin was with NASA for years and one of the first men to set foot upon the moon. He was a national hero. He saw and experienced things. These experiences affected him. He had a nervous breakdown. At least, that's the official story. Author Fred Stecklin claims that Aldrin was silenced. The reason was very simple. Aldrin saw alien bases on the moon. It is claimed by hundreds of investigators that actual close-up photographs of the moon have been tampered with. They have been airbrushed to remove what is really there, hidden from our sight. It is a stated fact that all photographs, then and now, are vetted by NASA before released to the public. Why? Aldrin claimed that they were not the first people to set foot upon the moon. Somebody, or something, had been there before. Alien vehicles flew within 50 feet of a US space vehicle for one full Earth orbit, and then the AV departed. Again, while Aldrin was present, Buzz Aldrin had a nervous breakdown because of these events and the pressure not to talk. There have been 22 deaths, many suicides, at JSC in Houston. No astronaut who has seen AVs or ETs is allowed to talk about it, even amongst themselves. If they do, and are caught, they may be fined, publicly humiliated, imprisoned, or have all pensions and future salaries taken away. Buzz Aldrin himself said, there was something out there that was close enough to be observed, and what could it be? Mike Collins decided he thought he could see it in the telescope, and he was able to do that, and when it was in one position. What we do know, is that there are literally thousands of pilots, both military and commercial, who have witnessed UFOs visiting the Earth, and not just above the atmosphere. A woman known as Jackie recently came forward. Her name is being kept a secret for her own safety. She claims she worked for NASA, and that she actually witnessed humans on Mars. Through the live feed that goes directly into NASA, 
she saw humans in spacesuits walking on the planet. Here's what she said in a live interview on Coast to Coast Radio. That old Viking rover was running around. Then I saw two men in spacesuits. Not the bulky suits we normally use, but they looked protective. They came over the horizon, walking to the Viking explorer. When she saw this, along with six other colleagues, they immediately reported it. We ran upstairs, but they locked the door and taped paper over the door so we couldn't see. My question is, were they our guys? None of her colleagues have ever come forward, but there are hundreds of reports of secret space programs starting right back in the 1960s. In 2005, an ex-employee of the Defence Intelligence Agency began leaking classified information about an alien exchange program called Project Serpo. The ex-DIA employee stated that it was one of the aliens, known as EBE-1, and even helped organise a special team of humans to visit his home world, known as Serpo, in the Zeta Reticuli system. This happened in 1965, and the team stayed on Serpo until 1978. Two died there, two stayed on the planet, and the rest returned. All have died due to radiation poisoning. There is a man who worked for NASA as a spacecraft operator at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. He was involved in over 650 missions, including the Mercury and Apollo expeditions and the space shuttle period. His name is Clark McKelland, and it was during this time on the space shuttle mission that he witnessed something very strange. According to McClellan, he was monitoring the mission from his desk at the Kennedy Launch Control Center when he saw something. Here's his statement. I, Clark C. McClellan, former spacecraft operator, space shuttle fleet, personally observed an eight to nine foot tall ET on 27 inch video monitors while on duty in the Space Kennedy Center, Launch Control Center. The ET was standing upright in the Space Shuttle payload bay, having a discussion with two tethered US NASA astronauts. I also observed on my monitors the spacecraft of the ET, as it was in a stabilized, safe orbit to the rear of the Space Shuttle main engine pods. I observed this incident for about one minute and seven seconds plenty of time to memorize all that I was observing. It was an ET and alien starship. Here's what he said. The Pentagon owns NASA. Some of the Department of Defense missions I participated in were top secret. Those missions carried TS satellites and other space mission hardware into orbit where several crews met with ETs. He claims that the US government has been keeping a secret, a long-standing military alliance with aliens for decades, in league with the Human Exchange Program. Edgar Mitchell was the sixth man to walk on the moon. He was an highly intelligent man top astronaut and American hero. He states quite openly that very high-ranking military officials saw alien ships monitoring the 1940s nuclear weapons tests. The CIA and NASA are covering up what they all saw. The Russians say that both Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong saw spacecraft moments after landing on the moon and that they relayed a message back to mission control that two large objects landed near to them and were observing them. They even state that Aldrin took colour footage of the UFOs from inside their module and continued filming when Armstrong went outside. According to Armstrong, aliens actually have a base on the moon and humans were being warned off. Radio hams with their own VHF receiving facilities bypassed NASA's broadcasting outlets 
and picked up the following exchange from the moon. Mission Control calling Apollo 11. Apollo 11. These babies are huge, sir. Enormous. Oh my God. You wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you there are other spacecraft out there. Lined up on the far side of the crater edge. They're on the moon. Watching us. Armstrong later said in an interview, It was incredible. Of course we had always known there was a possibility. The fact is, we were warned off. There was never any question then of a space station or a moon city. I can't go into details, except to say that their ships were far superior to ours, both in size and technology. And boy were they big and menacing. No, there is no question of a space station. The sociological impact resulting from the attack on September 11, 2001 is so far-reaching it's impossible to measure its magnitude. Our civil liberties have been compromised, the expansion of surveillance and invasion of privacy upon the citizens continues to this day, but most importantly the event opened the door for the Middle East invasion. The one part of the world that the Illuminati has no governing power over is the Middle East, and until they have complete global control, they can't proceed to the next phase of a one world government. Many of these theorists believe the attacks were part of a false flag effort to allow the federal government to easily enact laws like the Patriot Act that would pave the way for consolidating totalitarian control over the populace. Building 7 was next to the towers. It too appears to have been destroyed by demolition, but it was not hit by planes. In fact, it should have little to no damage at all. Building 7 housed field offices of the SEC, FBI, CIA, NSA, among others. It contained tons of information on corporate fraud that could, collectively, have constituted major crimes that would have put many individuals away for a few hundred years. Building 7 also housed several intelligence and law enforcement agencies and the New York City Office of Emergency Management's Emergency Operations Center. If you want to get rid of any evidence of conspiracy, Building 7 would be a crucial target for destruction. If fire caused Building 7 to collapse, it would be the first ever fire-induced collapse of a still frame high-rise. Building 7's collapse was not mentioned in the 9-11 Commission report. It took the federal government seven years to conduct an investigation and issue a report for Building 7. In addition, 1,700 architects and engineers have signed a petition calling for a new investigation into the destruction of Building 7, specifying that it should include a full inquiry into the possible use of explosives. Numerous witnesses say the possibility of demolishing Building 7 was widely discussed by emergency personnel at the scene and advocated by the building's owner. Why was it so important that this building be destroyed during the 9-11 event? Similarly, the offices that were the target of the missile that struck the Pentagon were those of several auditors digging into $2.6 trillion in missing or untraceable money. In addition to the Twin Towers and Building 7, the World Trade Center complex included Buildings 3, 4, 5, and 6. Compared to Building 7, all of these buildings were severely damaged, first by falling rubble from the Twin Towers, 
and then by fires that burned for hours. Although these buildings were in critical condition, none of them collapsed. Was 9-11 a false flag event intended to hide a litany of corruption and criminal activity of the government? Was it intended to generate enough fear in which the government could set into motion the erosion of our civil liberties and create a police state? Since 9-11, our police now look far more like a military than officers, having received surplus military equipment from two wars due to 9-11. We have seen the creation of Homeland Security, the TSA, and the Patriot Act, all as a result of this one event. And as of date, we have discovered the NSA can and does spy on every American citizen. Are we living under a new world order? Look around and you decide. If you do your research, you'll discover that pretty much everything I've been disclosing is already out there. A lot of witnesses and whistleblowers have come forward and have released what they know to the public. The truth is sitting right in front of us. You just have to wink through the misinformation and hoaxes perpetrated by our government to throw the public off the trail. But for the future of our kids and their kids, we must act now. These malevolent powers secretly controlling our planet must be exposed, pulled out of the shadows and into the light so that we as a people can exist in a world full of hope and prosperity.